Now for our next uh, presentation, imagine all of the energy of John Chambers and all of the terrifying authority of a Nobel Prize winning chemist uh, in one package. And uh, you pretty much have uh, Jim Phillips, uh, who's uh, a visionary world changer, whose uh, resume is as tall as this building. Um, but uh, he's here to tell us how to make atoms work harder and smarter. Please welcome from Nanomech, the CEO of Nanomech, Jim Phillips. Thank you, John, appreciate it. Good to be amongst all you uh, crazy risk takers, because that's what it takes, right? Uh, to be in uh, a startup or to be in innovation. And uh, that's where it all begins. You wake up every morning, as they say, incredibly excited and scared to death. And uh, you know, that's what it takes. And that's been my entire life. And, and uh, it's been a heck of a ride and a lot of fun. And it's uh, a privilege to be here with you. And uh, you know, making atoms work harder and smarter is a lot of fun. This is kind of a third generation part of my life is to be involved in nanoscale engineering and, and manufacturing. And it, it truly is a game changer, world changer. They asked if I could in like just a few minutes <laughs> explain what nanotechnology is, nanoengineering is, nanomanufacturing is, make it interesting, show some examples, and uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll be fast. We'll, we'll do a New York speed on this thing. Uh, really, nano is a lot more than just scale, and we'll talk about scale. It's a billionth of a meter, and manufacturing down at that level is, is just incredible, but it's almost always about material sciences, and, and that's what we do at Nano Mac in a, in a, in a big way. You know, we live in a tremendous time. I mean, this is, this is an exciting uh, moment in history. Uh, you, heard, you heard John talk about it a little bit, Chambers, today. Uh, everybody pretty much is saying, you know, whether you're at a Fortune 100 company or a, a new startup in Silicon Valley or wherever, uh, more, will, more will be invented in the next five years than in the history of mankind. We're now at that pace. And the reason we're at that pace is because of those inventions that most of the people are old enough in here that we've lived through in the last 20 years, but the inventions, the chip and software, storage, which just continues to amaze all of us in terms of how much storage you can get uh, put together, and of course, with, with that big data and the coming on of big data. And then, of course, the internet, the fact that we can collaborate worldwide instantaneously, scientist to scientist, marketeer to marketeer, so fast that, that we have really created an accelerator of invention uh, like never before. And so uh, with that, you know, you, 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 you're always supposed to go about 100,000 feet and, and look back a little bit. But, you know, these revolutions that we can kind of recall that were in the textbooks anyway, when we were going to school early on, you know, it always talks about, of course, the Industrial Revolution and the invention of the machine and really more than that, the invention of the assembly line, which is important. And, you know, most people think of Ford when they think of that and how that was all accomplished and, and definitely creating a the ability to create assembly lines with quality control, repeatability, scalability, uh, and, and being able to squirt out products that actually can make a profit, that are must-have products. That's, that's huge, and it's hard to do. It's really, really hard to do. And then along comes the digital revolution uh, with uh, broadband and, of course, all our smartphones, and, and we can go forever in that. And because of different business models every day, the digital revolution continues to even accelerate more, which you heard with you know, the Internet of Things and so forth. But way beyond that, and dwarfing that, is in the world of material science, which is in a huge comeback. Manufacturing in the United States, you know, which really makes us what we are uh, as a nation, and any, any nation, uh, the competitiveness of that nation ties directly to its manufacturing. And you know, we've seen our manufacturing, as part of our D, uh, GDP, drop... Uh, oh, I don't know, in the last 20, 30 years, and there's a lot of statistics on this, for somewhere around 79% down to 17%. We're in a little bit of a rebound now. Some people have it as much as 22 to 24%. Without manufacturing, if you don't make anything, okay, you really cease to become a nation. It also impairs incredibly your national security, your ability to, you know, I hate to use the word because a lot of people are just like all into peace, but the way we get peace is through weaponization. We actually have as a nation the best weapons. And, and so what you're looking at here is, is a, a good example of nanotechnology. So that's a trigger gear on the right. And that trigger gear is you know, invisible. And it's in your cell phones and other places. It's also in an atom bomb. And uh, that's about 12 to 14-year-old technology. So nanotechnology, this billionth of a meter and above, 
capability to manufacture things has been around for a number of years. And it's now picked up incredible speed, and you'll find at every major university, uh, tremendous amounts of funding and, and, and training on a nanoscale engineering. In fact, it's you know, really uh, become, at the end of the day, a moon race. And that moon race is moving very, very fast. We saw analog to digital with the digital re-architecting of everything. I mean, of everything. And it's still happening, and it's, it's picked up speed. But dwarfing that, really, is as we move from what made manufacturing great over the last 40, 50 years was micron scale uh, engineering. And a 1,000 times smaller than that is, of course, nanoscale engineering. And it affects every industry. We can make anything better. Whether you're wearing it, you're sitting on it, or you're driving it, or you're flying in it, we can make anything better by building it nanoscale. And you're going to hear more and more and more and more about that over the next 20 years. There's thousands of nano startups, not just in the United States, but around the world. And so it's going to happen very, very quickly. And the reason being is, is that this scale, you know, which when you, when you start going down and you see that in our factories, we have factories. In Nanomech, we have factories. We have laboratories. We work a lot on electron microscopy to start things out and to really understand at our scientist level what it is we can change the way of materials. But you can see, you know, the width of a bee here, 100,000 nanometers. That's, that's big. Red blood cell, 10,000 nanometers. I mean, one red blood cell. Bacteria, 1,000 nanometers big. Just one bacteria. Then you move into when you sneeze, the virus, you, you sneeze a trillion viruses, they're 100 nanometers. And then a carbon nanotube, which we hear about, 10 nanometers. This one might kind of give you some size complexity, but half a DNA helix, one nanometer. And then if you looked at an atom, an atom is about 10 times bigger than a nano. And we're actually manufacturing in those scale scenarios uh, really incredible things that can be a lot more complex. Without the electron microscope, without the electron microscopy, we couldn't do that. That's become incredibly less expensive, more pervasive everywhere. And because of that, we're able to now operate inside this universe, which truly is a different universe. For instance, right here, this is a universe, and it is the universe. So we're looking at the Hubble Space Scope, and we're seeing out you know, maybe a billion miles, a trillion miles, and you all buy that. You, you've seen it. You know, so it's a kind of two times a million miles, a, you know, two million, a hundred million, fifty, you know, so on and up. And we, we buy into that, and it's exciting. It's interesting. We don't know what the heck's out there really at the end of the day and everything, and there, it's getting a lot of attention and a lot of funding. But, you know, if you held your hand up at four feet and you did 2x and went up, you buy that. A lot of people don't buy what I'm about to say, but if I live to be a million and you all live to be a million years here, you know, and I'm still dividing by two, okay, a million years from now, I still haven't hit the floor. And inside that uh, paradigm are millions of new universes of materials and places to build things, do things differently, better, and it's going to revolutionize everything, especially medicine. And in your lifetime, you'll see that happen. So, uh, so you're looking at a brain cell on one side, you know, at nanoscale, and the universe on the other side. And they look kind of similar. They're universes. And we have that ability today to go after that. To manipulate atoms at this scale, this is from uh, Louis Schwartzberg, who did a tremendous animation on this. It's at the Ross Perot Museum. But it describes how you're able to literally, atom by atom, build and, and reconstruct uh, all types of matter and so forth. So uh, a, a nice looking approach at it. Or go into on the medical side if you need, if you have a chromosome problem and you want to either take out a chromosome, build into the chromosome structure somehow, some way, this is coming at a speed you would not believe. With the FDA, it'll probably happen in Europe somewhere first, but it's coming and it's being worked on every day. So nano comes in all kinds of shapes, sizes, descriptions and everything. So you're seeing everything from quantum dots here to nano, you know, nanoparticles, to graphene, fullerenes, nanotubes, nanowires, and all of those have industries within themselves that are moving very, very fast. To give you an idea, it's the fastest growing industry. I mean, you don't see it. It's the old BASF model. You remember the ad that said, we don't make things, we just make everything better? And to a certain extent, that's what you're going to see with nanoscale engineering. So everybody in here is, has got something you've already purchased, probably over 50 things, that have nanoscale engineering, whether it's your clothes, or your glasses, if you've got anti-scratch glasses, that's nanoscale engineering on that film. So uh, you can see the kind of growth that we're, we're looking at right here. The United States is investing about an average and half for years and years now of $2 billion a year. We have to in order to keep up with companies like China or countries like China. This is the Nanopolis, about 125 acres in China. Uh, there's real pictures of that too. You can look them up on the internet. But uh, that's not for research. That's for commercialization. 
So they want to do to the United States what they did to the United States in solar, in batteries, and so forth. We were talking about security before I got up here. I, I'm told, and Dr. A.J. Moshi, Dr. Parash Kalita, some of our, you know, our actual leaders, founder uh, scientists that are in here, you know, we got a visit from the FBI, and they said, you guys in the southern United States, you're the most hit firewall by the Chinese uh, cyber militia, and it's X million times a day. So in order to do this research that we do, because of those kind of things, we have to go off the grid, can't put anything on the grid a lot of times, and just put it in our lab books. So that, that, that's real. And Russ Nano's out there. They've got a $20 billion fund that they're investing in the United States and all over the world. If they can't make it, they might as well buy into it, so they're making investments into companies like us. So this is all happening, maybe under the radar to a certain extent, but it's happening every day. And your major, major U.S. Fortune 500 companies, there's not one that doesn't have a nano department right now of some type, nanoscience, where they're investigating it or they're already delivering products or they're acquiring nano companies like a Lockheed Martin who's already acquired two, three, four uh, nanoscience companies. So uh, when you get into kind of giving examples, and I'm going to do a little bit of this right now. This is child's play. So this is the London Bridge, and you can see it's, done, it's built to scale. Uh, this is, again, 10-year-old technology, but this is one granule of sand that is taken apart and built uh, at, in effect, nanoscale uh, to, to show what we can do. Now, you can't sell that. You can't make any money at that. Uh, you can make a presentation on that. But these things, you know, can be monetized. So when you start looking at the pharmaceutical industry and you realize that there's a tremendous amount of counterfeits, counterfeiting going on and, things, and tampering and things like that, you can easily put in uh, code and things like that uh, at nanoscale uh, so that you can keep up with those type of things. Uh, you can also put tracers and stuff like that at nanoscale, which are going to become more and more important, I promise you. Your money, all your new bills, if you've looked at them, held them up in the light and everything, there's nanoscale engineering going into that to avoid counter, counterfeiting and, and things like that as long as money exists, which we were told today and probably won't exist much longer at the end of the day. But, you know, for, for while it's here, we've got to avoid counterfeiting. This is the only way to do that. Now, a lot of this gets into... Um, you know, what's called, you know, mimicking in terms of nature. And so the ability to biomimic or however you want to say it. So we look at nature. So whatever, whatever side you're on, we can call it Mother Nature or we can call it God. At, at nano, you're down at that God level, Mother Nature level in terms of invention. And, and it's an incredible place to be when you're spending a lot of time on electron microscopy and you're seeing things you never dreamed you'd see before in the way of structures and how you can create these structures and, and move them into products uh, overnight, literally. And so uh, with that, uh, I thought I'd bring a few examples around. It's not just us. It's not just our generation. So a guy named Da Vinci was making airplane drawings back in 500. And, you know, this is his wing. This is biomimicry because what did he base that on? You know, here's a guy that never saw anybody fly, never flew himself. And that's a pretty doggone accurate representation of a bat wing. And based on that, a lot of flight and a lot of things were developed years, hundreds of years after that, uh, that made a difference, and it continues. So this is NASA. This is adaptive wing, wing technology through nanoscale engineering, nano, nano composites, nano coatings, and everything. The future when you're flying, if you, if you want flying where you don't have you know, rough air, where you, you can avoid the rough air, you can uh, really increase your, your mileage and things like that, you're going to be, be moving very quickly to adaptive wing structures. That will happen very fast. So this is one of our friends right here, and so you're looking at a chameleon, and uh, you know they have incredible power. They have the power to change color, and so as you're watching this, uh, you know think about looking at it through an electron mic microscope or or what have you, and you begin to see a translucent cell structure in that animal that is fabulous. And to that extent, you can duplicate that. You can basically take that from nature, and uh, use it in all kinds of products. You can replicate that. And, and uh, the way we do it, perhaps, is cars. So if you don't want your orange car, take an electrode, put it up to there with the same type translucent cell structure that can be replicated and done uh, in nanotechnology. It suddenly goes to that color, or perhaps today you wanted a green one. And so you're going to see that that's just one example. There's a lot of that that's already being done, and it's being done in weaponization. It's being done in, in other things. You can also create invisibility, cloaking, things like that. It only comes to you through nanoscale engineering. So this guy, this Labrador, supposedly has the best nose in the world, I mean, of all the dogs. Now, there's some arguments about that. But you'll see them in the battlefields and places like that, and they're fantastic. They have the ability to 
you know, smell downwind, all kinds of things that are coming. But if you want to smell upwind, two miles, then there's things like this right here, which is a uh, nano-scaled out uh, sensor, and it's come a long way. That's about five years old now, so that you can literally tell what the enemy ate that's two miles upwind from you uh, or downwind from you and, and be able to say that's this type of soldier, what have you. Or you can sniff out all kinds of things like explosives and other things like that. And again, down at nanoscale engineering, you're able to basically biomimic that, that dog's sensors and nose and so forth as you look at it. So this is a gecko. Some of you may have seen this at presentations like at TED uh, years ago. You can imagine how far this has come now. But when you, when you drill down into the electron microscope, into how is that gecko able to crawl on glass? Okay, How is it able to create, is it suction cups? What is it? And so at nanoscale, you're able to, again, reconstruct that, those millions of hairs that look more like Velcro than they do suction cups when you get down to it, and create guys like this that can go anywhere, crawl anywhere, uh, these robots. And then if, if you're uh, Tom Cruise, you get to even put it in a movie and crawl up a building. But you know whether that's uh, real or not, you'd have to be at a classified rating in the military, but it's coming. So uh, all these things at once. Now, this right here, what the heck is a bear doing in a nano presentation? Okay, so this is at, out of Alaska State. This guy's hibernating. So if you want to study uh, something for NASA, and this is a NASA project, so it's, it's based on travel in space. Everybody's talking about going to Mars, right? Everybody wants to go to Mars. Why do you want to go to Mars? But anyway, so, you know, uh, there's so much here we could do, right? Uh, but if you do, you're going to need probably some form of suspended animation right there. Now, if you do that, you know, going back and looking at this guy, how did he hibernate? How did he drop his temperature from 300, or his uh, heartbeat from 300 beats down to three beats and put himself in a colder state so he shivered so he didn't get so cold that, you know, he died during that, the winter, whether it was a four-month hibernation or a six- or a nine-month hibernation, and that's really in a form of suspended hibernation. Now, if you extract that chemistry, you know, because at the same time while he was sitting there asleep, okay, and he wakes up, if you and I sit down for six months, the atrophy is incredible. Your atrophy, you, you won't even be able to stand up, okay? This guy just stands up, and his memory's even intact, to the extent that if he takes a right, he drops off a 600-foot cliff. He, if he goes left, he goes down into the meadow, everything's cool. And all of that happens. And if you extract that chemistry, you can move into things like suspended animation. But more importantly, if you extract that chemistry, put it into a nanoscale engineering format, okay, you have the capability and the potential of doing things like injecting that into a tumor and putting that tumor basically into sleep and it goes away. So all of these things are happening and they wanted me to show you a few of these things that are happening on a broad scale, which is what I'm doing. And so these are nanobots, nanobots that, you know, if you saw in real size, uh, you wouldn't see them because they'd be too small. So in the area of quantum nanodots and that technology, it's coming again incredibly fast. And, you know, Edison, five years out, you're going to see nano in so many of the pr products that are, that are here. They're already in some. I've walked around, which is great. And it's going to be more than just stain-proof clothes, okay? It's going to be a lot of other things. And now because of our FDA and because it tries to protect us and everything, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff's being built uh, in Europe right now. But when that happens uh, and you're able to go right after the tumor through magnetic control of the quantum nanodots and destroy the tumor or whatever you're trying to do in that, in that case, um, you'll be able to do that uh, without using chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is basically, and it's fantastic, it's saved lots and lots of lives, but it's basically designed to kill the entire body and get the tumor first and then bring the body back to life. And it's going to look a lot like to uh, people 10 years from now, like probably what bloodlet, bloodletting looked like in the 1700s. And it's this kind of science that will take us there. So with that, then you move into anything that can be, you know, manufactured can typically be weaponized. So you're looking at a UAV from General Atomics. Now, one of the problems with that guy is he makes a lot of noise, so you don't get his digital signature, but you might need oils and greases and lubes that makes that guy very, very silent because right now you can scan the skies, find out where they are, and if you're really trying to defeat, and if your kids, by the way, are over there, you want that to happen. Uh, so that's happening, and they're also getting a lot smaller. And you see those right now. In fact, they outnumber airplanes. Just in a matter of a few years, you've got 400,000 UAVs, and they're outnumbering aircraft. And so it's, it's coming very, very fast. But on the weaponization side, it's coming incredibly fast. And so you're seeing them at this size. 
This is not new. You probably all saw this at some point in time through DARPA. The Hummingbird, you know, weighs about the same as a AA battery, uh, and it has 18 miles, up to 18 miles uh, flight capacity. Uh, you also have the ability to, through induction, keep these out in the field forever because they can get on a power line and induct their electricity and stay out there. They can be camera equipped. They can do all kinds of things. If your son, daughter, is going house to house to do a clearing, uh, you'd be really awfully glad that we have these, you know. And so, uh, but they get smaller. And this one, of course, has a hypodermic needle on it. And uh, this is five-year-old technology as well. You get into the classified space, but you can also run those at swarms, which they are already. If you go online, hit the Navy, hit Locust, you'll see some of this stuff. And it's coming incredibly fast. Frankly, I'm an well, American patriot. I just hope we always have the best weapons. I, I can't get into the argument of when all this stuff gets in the wrong hands, what happens? Because at the end of the day, we all know technology at the end of the day is a reflection of society. And it's something bigger than this conversation, but it gets into ethics and so forth. But all of this is coming at an incredible speed. So uh, with that, what do we do <laughs> day to day at Natomec to make a living? And this will be real quick. But, you know, we're helping the Army with, with you know, and, and pretty soon your clothes. So I want your clothes to be antibacterial, antimicrobial, uh, anti-odor, anti, um, all these multifunctionalities. Uh, totally super hydrophobic, so if you step out in a rain shower, uh, you, you know, you don't get wet. And also completely fireproof, especially for your kids, those pajamas. But it can't change the material. Today we can do that. The material gets real heavy, gets real stiff. And so through nanotechnology and through this, what's called InGuard, we can do all that. And we can either do it one at a time, like on an app, or we can put it in a multifunctional capability to do that all at once. So that's, that's a lot of fun. And by the way, those guys are really menacing looking. These, these are not aliens from outer space. Those are your bed bugs you sleep with. Those are the mosquitoes and the fleas that you're with and that carry disease and everything else. And so the nanotechnology is going to really help in, in, the, in that. Uh, you know, weapons and going back to body armor and things like that. You know, if you, if you ever put one of these suits on that weigh up to 160 pounds and realize it's 110 degrees and you got to get out there and work, you want those things to work in a lot of different ways. You want an electronic grid that's a nano grid on that so that if you get shot, you know, it automatically puts an anticoagulant on you. It automatically uh, puts an a, a antibiotic in, in you at that spot. And you have in your pocket a super lightweight cell that you can put back in and keep in, in that battle. So a lot of things changing in that space. But you can take that same type of capability, put it in your tents, put it in your sport clothes, and so forth, and take it to the consumer market. We all know the world runs on machines. Machines, 10 to 1, everybody's got at least 10 machines around them. And machines run on lubricants at the end of the day. Very boring lubricants, right? Uh, it's a trillion dollar plus industry, probably multi-trillion when you look at it, whether it's your air conditioners or what have you. So we make the best lubricants in the world, and we make them at nanoscale. Because what you're trying to get to, called disparities in the industry, is to create a nanotribological film uh, that is even self-replenishing that stays there so maybe you only have to fill for life one time. And, and it saves a lot in terms of uh, putting out fossil fuels. And at the same time, you also want to take out all the bad chemicals. And operating at nanoscale, you, you're really operating at a level where you're creating in elements, in element language, a three-dimensional element table or periodic index. And we have the capability to do that. So what we do is we've created a uh, lubricant that really takes the coefficient of friction down right to zero. We can manipulate that all we want and stop wear and stop friction and make things last longer and make them a lot safer, whether we're talking about your cars or trucks or aircraft or aerospace. And so, so that's one of the things we do. And we ship it in those kind of quantities, by the way. Atom oil. We can do the same thing. We can do greases. We can do an oil, and that's us shipping. So this is real. This is actually stuff that's going out. This is not a concept. And in the oil and gas industry, we can take out the ZDDP, put in canola oil, and quit polluting the oceans and everything else with the greases and the lubes that are out there that keep the heat down and uh, allow for the flow of the oil and gas, which, by the way, still counts for 95% of your energy, including what's running this air conditioning system in the water. So it's still really important. And uh, when we do that, this is the difference in wear. So if, we, if you look, this is a picture from a customer that they happen to be the largest provider of... Uh, of valves in the, the control all the flow of oil and gas in the, in the world. And on the left, this is not as vivid as I'd like it to be, but you can see without us, uh, it's destroyed. It's destroyed every component in that valve. And there's millions and millions and millions of valves out there, by the way. And that can lead, lead to spills and all kinds of things. 
And then on the right side, we just dropped in 5% of our very, very safe, uh, you know, in glide. And you can see it's zero wear after 10,000 cycles. And by the way, it took 45 minutes for us to get our lube off of that. And on the left, there, it, that's the picture. That's, there was no lube left on that. And so whether we're talking about your bicycle, your car, your trucks, your aircraft, whatever, this is going to make it a lot safer. It's going to last a lot longer and, and be very important. In the automotive industry, it's not just the basic cars. But when Tesla was here two years ago, we had discussions, meetings, and they had a real issue. To make those cars run at 18,000 RPM, to be the fastest four-door cars in the world, they said to us, can you create a lube? Nobody else can. I can name all the companies. You know who they are. Within two weeks, people like Ajay Malche was were out there working with them uh, on site, and we fixed all those issues. So there's absolutely nowhere, even at 18,000, 20,000 uh, RPM back in the transaxles and, and the way you make those things work. So even to the battery cars, to create them to where they really can even put in an unlimited warranty, uh, it, it requires this type of technology. Now we do a lot more things besides that for Tesla. In the world of racing, if you're in lubes and everything, it all starts at that level. You know, so we're in uh, IndyCar racing. So we went with Penske two years ago. They hadn't won the world championship in six years. We lubed uh, two cars, and with those two cars, we won the world championship. And so it, it does work. This is us working with Will Power. He won that year. And then this last year, they said, we've got to win the Indy 500. And the, the legal book, by the way, is about that thick. So this, this meets all the rules, regulations. But we changed out the wheel bearings, other things. It increases miles per gallon, miles per hour, all good for everybody everywhere. And it increases horsepower, too. Uh, because it's reducing friction, it's reducing wear, and it's making it a lot safer. And so we won the Indy 500 this year, and that was pictures of us inside the winter circle. Uh, so just going through this real quick, like uh, you can see obviously the impact on the trucking industry. These are cutting tools. Everything that's made has to be cut. These seats got cut by cutting tools somewhere. Your car engines, everything else. So we, we, we spray on, and it's all patented, but a cubic boron nitride, it's the hardest substance known to man. You know, it can be even harder than diamond, but it adheres. Nobody else could do that before, so all that was heavily, heavily patented. And we, so we create cutting tools now that last 10 times longer. And while we're doing that, when we do that, uh, we also create a nano serrated edge so you get a better finish. That allows you to have machines with tighter tolerances, more extreme pressure that create better machines, machines that you, you don't even know are coming in the way of future trucks, future automobiles that are safer better and so forth, all because of nanotechnology uh, being adapted into that. So this is a chemical vaporization deposition unit. Everybody knows what a CVD is, right? So this is the final stage, 2,000 degrees, and we're pumping into that in a nanoscale structured way, things like hafnium nitride uh, and titanium nitride, little coatings that you couldn't see with your eye that go on those cutting tools at, that are, are the core of all manufacturing. And when finished, it gives you those kind of results so we can make things better, manufacture better, compete better as a nation. Uh, so, and it goes into all kinds of things. That's a GE engine core on the side. Uh, just in case you hadn't ever seen it, that's a bunker bomb. And the amount of cutting and level and sophistication to armaments and things like that are phenomenal. And so let's go down to the atom level for a second. This is actually our stuff. This gives you a hierarchical, nano-engineered, multifunctional overlay. That, that is us using what we won the Edison Award for this year. And I'm three slides away if I've overtaken my time, but I'm, I'm almost finished. So you'll see out there a thing called Gardex. With Gardex, we've created a super thin coating to take the temperature down on your uh, exhausts, whether you're a John Deere or Caterpillar or a, just in your car, down as much as 200 degrees centigrade, and also do away with the abrasive, with the wear, make them completely anti-corrosive, and we do it with incredibly safe materials. And it'll increase warranties, it'll increase, uh, decrease service costs, and it'll make things last longer. It'll create a, it, as some people say, with the cars and everything else that it's going to do in terms of creating more durability, a, a world middle class, that things will last longer, whether it's the suit you're wearing or the car you're giving up that goes to 20 other owners over the next 20 years. And the car industry won't suffer from that, so, so because they'll still be providing parts, they'll be providing all kinds of things as those things last longer. And what you're seeing right there, let me just real quick like go through this. So you see uh, the nanoscale at that point in time, you're, you're, you can see the nanoparticles are 20 to 30 nanometers. We move them into microparticles through our what's called convergent assembly. And when we do that, we're adding all kinds of capabilities. We're multifunctionalities. And, and, and then the final product goes out. You see this. This is actually the overlay coating. And it goes into a coating, which you see on the right, that then goes on to the manifolds 
into the impellers that, 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 that are in all the pumps that exist anywhere in the world, and they last so much longer, they're more dependable, and it takes out the bad chemistry. So that's, that's what we won this year for. We won a couple years ago for some other things, and you'll also see in our, our little booth uh, paint. We've just created what we think is by far and away the world's best paint. It's completely antibacterial, anti microbial, but it's, more importantly, it's totally anti-corrosive. And you can only do that through the science of nanotechnology, which I didn't make it in 15 minutes, but I tried. Thanks. <laughs> so.